So whenever Postgres receives a SQL query from the client, it parses the query, creates a parse tree and hands it off to planner and optimizer, whose job is to create an optimal query execution plan for a given SQL query. Now, for it to generate the most optimal plan, it first needs to generate all possible plan through which a SQL query can be executed. For example, given a SQL query, there is not just one way to execute it. There will be multiple ways or multiple query plans which when executed would result the same result. Right? Now, the job of the planner and optimizer is to generate all possible plans and then pick the most efficient one. Now, how it picks the most efficient one? So basically, there is a cost based optimizer that it uses. So for every generated plan, it estimates the cost involved in it. And then it picks the one with the least amount of cost. Right? Now, for each generated plan, the cost that I was talking about, how it generates, what are the parameters that it considers? It considers that in order for me to execute this query plan, what would be the rough estimate of the number of disk accesses or the number of rows processed or if I'm using the right indexes or not. So it does that. It does that simple numerical estimation to figure out which is the most efficient one. This is what we'll touch upon in subsequent videos. But in this one, our entire focus would be on to generate all possible query execution plans for a given query and how a database like Postgres or in general any relational database does it. Now, first, the first step that any planner and optimizer does in order to generate all possible uh, query execution plan is that whatever tables are involved in the SQL query. Right? Now, those tables would need to be scanned Right? Because you would be querying, you would be finding like select start from this table where something equal to something. Right? In such queries, table needs to be scanned for their rows. Now here we have two cases. Either you do a by default a sequential scan of the table to whatever you are looking for, and then an index scan in case the index is available. So what optimizer does? It does not just say, hey, I have an index, I'll just pick it. It basically considers all possible ways through which it can do it. So in a candidate set. It adds that, hey, I would add a sequential scan of the table by default. And in case the index is available, I'll add index also. Right? So for example, if my query is select start from blogs where user ID is equal to 1729 order by timestamp. So here the sequential scan of blogs table is added. Another variation is where if the index on user ID exists, it would add an index scan on the table on that specific index. And because I'm ordering by timestamp, it would also check in case there is an index available for the timestamp column or not. So this would be the three potential ways through which my sequence or through which I would be scanning my table. Right? Okay. Then the second is where the joins would come in. Joins, most critical part. There are three algorithms through which two tables are joined by the database engine. First is nested loop join. Second is merge join. Third is hash join. In the previous video, I've talked about it in detail. I'll add it to the I card. You can, you can find it there. Right? We'll not go into the implementation of these algorithms in this one. Assume that these, there are three algorithms through which two tables are joined. Right? Now, which join to pick depends on the size of the table. The join condition that we have given, for example, an equi join, hash join is better. Right? For others, for a small data set, nested loop join is better. For a large data set, merge join is better. But it also depends on the column value distribution. Let's say if you have a column with high cardinality versus a low cardinality, depending on join condition, which one works better. So what your database does, it basically considers all possible cases, all possible join orders, all possible algorithms, and then it estimates the cost for each one of them. For example, what planner does in case of Postgres, now I'll go slightly specific to Postgres. So a planner typically does an exhaustive search or to find the best join sequence. So for example, if I'm joining two tables, table A and table B, then I can join A with B or B with A, both would look to the same result. But the effective or the, the time it would take for me to, to join the two tables would depend on the join order sequence. Let's say if I have five tables, which two tables should I join first and which two tables should I join later? It's like a classic matrix multiplication problem from dynamic programming, if you remember, right? That stuff. So, the order of the joints matter because if you are, if you reduce the number of rows with initial set of joints, the other joints would complete faster. That's why the join, uh, the join order matters. Now for all the tables involved, 
Postgres planner typically does an exhaustive search for all possible combinations for all possible algorithms and then it adds it to its candidate set for it to estimate the query or to estimate the cost of the query execution. So here there is a threshold that it re uh, that refers to. So if your number of relations in your from clause when you are doing joins and all, if it is less than 12, it does an exhaustive search. It does an exhaustive search. Otherwise, it tries to estimate and then pick the best one using statistics which are available. So the name of the threshold is GEQO threshold, which is basically genetic query optimization threshold. And it is set the default value is 12, but you can change it. The whole idea is that the cost of running a suboptimal query in case when I'm doing a very large join, what is the cost of doing an exhaustive search or across all possible cases versus figuring out using statistics, the best or the, or the better ones. Right? So this is where for a small set of tables, it's better to do an exhaustive search, which is much faster for you to compute or to basically consider to get that exhaustive set. Right? So that is what it writes as the default value is 12, but it can change, but it is tunable. Now, for example, if I'm doing a join of the table for blogs with users on user ID equal to blog, uh, blog .user ID equal to user .id, then I have these other possible cases. I join blogs and users with nested loop, blogs and users with merge join, blogs and users with hash join or users and blog with nested loop, users and blog with merge and users and blog with hash. So all of these candidates are added, right? And then for each one of them, you basically consider the cost and then you pick the best one. Right? The third thing that planner does in order to generate all possible cases or all possible plans is that the projection attribute. So the columns that you pass in the select select thing. So select user ID, username, whatnot. So that projection attributes that you have, it tries to typically put it as low as possible in the query execution plan it generates. Because for example, there is no point to filter those things out at the end, like right before you send, because you are just unnecessarily processing and moving those results from one step to another step. So the easiest one or the most efficient way to do it is to trim off and just pick the columns that you need bottom up. This way you reduce the amount of data that needs to be processed at each level. Right? So a planner typically attaches the projection attributes, whatever you have passed in, in the select clause and the where clause in as low as possible so that it can execute or it can generate very, it can generate relatively efficient plans. And these are the possible, and these are the ways through which your Postgres or in general, any relational databases creates all possible plans to execute the same query resulting in the same result set and then figures out the best one. Right? In subsequent videos, we'll also touch upon the, how the cost is computed and whatnot. But in this one, I just wanted to emphasize on how multiple query execution plans are generated by Postgres and in general, any relational databases, right? And yeah, this is all what I wanted to cover in this one. I hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Thank you.